good afternoon to you. God bless you. It's really good to be with you. It is really good to be with you. It's always great to leave Croydon, praise the Lord. <laughs> Trouble is going back. But it's particularly good to leave Croydon when I come to meet you. I'm so delighted that there is a vibrant group of people in the centre of London that loves Jesus. And may God bless you abundantly as you seek to convey the truth about Jesus in our day and generation. And I know that you respect the word of God. So do I. <clears throat> and go for the freedom we have to preach God's word. Um, but preachers shouldn't get beyond themselves and uh, it's a temptation to do that sometimes I guess. So I was thinking on the way here I thought of a very old joke. All my jokes are old because I'm getting old myself. <laughs> anyway, this uh, preacher, he appeared on Sunday morning and he had a huge plaster on the side of his cheek. And he said, uh, I must apologise to you for my appearance, he said. Uh, when I was uh, shaving this morning, I was thinking about my sermon and I cut my face. <laughs> and uh, at the end of the meeting, they found a little note in the offering bag that said, uh, next time, why don't you think about your face and cut your sermon? <laughs> That might be more relevant to you at the end than uh, it is right now. Well, the title of my message is Let Us Draw Near. Let Us Draw Near from Hebrews 10, 22. I want to try and explain why, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you can draw near to the very presence of God. And that God actually wants you to do that. It's the amazing privilege of those who have trusted in Jesus as their Saviour. But only for those who have trusted in Jesus as their Saviour. Yeah. Those who have not believed in Christ have no such right to draw near to God. Although, of course, they could have that right if they would give their hearts to the Lord. Well, we'll see how we go. But at the end, if, depending on time and how we feel things are going, it's good maybe to spend a little time where we do actually consciously draw near to God. I know we've been in the presence of God with the wonderful worship we've had and song, it's been great. But just at the end, just to take opportunity, we'll see how it goes to actually draw near to God. Now, sometimes at New Life we have two morning services at half past nine and half past eleven. The half past nine service can be a bit of a challenge for us time-wise and uh, very often you don't get a lot of time to speak. Um, so sometimes what I do is I, I make notes giving the Bible references that people can take if they want. And that enables me to go more quickly. Um, now, I, I did some notes for this particular talk a few weeks ago, and I brought a few copies with me just in case any of you would want those at the end. The other thing that it does, of course, is it enables you to check what the preacher says. And that's a good thing. You shouldn't just accept something because somebody at the front says it. You should be like the Bereans in Acts who went back and checked it out in the Bible. So that allows you to do that. So if you would like a copy of these, you can help yourself at the end. I only charge £10 per Bible reference. Amen. <laughs> so I was watching the God Channel and somebody's talking about a private jet and I thought, oh, I should do I should have a private jet. So this is my private jet fund. Please <laughs> give generously. Well, being able to draw near to Almighty God is amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And we shouldn't underestimate how amazing it is. Now we live in a very non-deferential age where nobody really respects anybody. And because of that, it's quite easy for us in this culture to take for granted the fact that we can draw near to God. But we shouldn't. You see, even human beings go to tremendous lengths sometimes to keep other people away. Uh, there's an example in the scripture actually in Esther where, do you remember Esther went, uh, she wanted to see the king but she said, well unless he invites me in, if I just walk into his presence I'll be killed. 
But in our culture, even in the 21st century, many people jealously guard their privacy and their property. I remember reading about a plot of land alongside a convent, and there was a big sign up saying private property, and underneath it said, everyone trespassing on this land will, without exception, be prosecuted to the fullest possible extent of the law. Signed, the Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> Not much mercy in that. <laughs> Apparently there's a sign on a farm in the States which says trespassers will be shot, survivors will be shot again. <laughs> People jealously guard their privacy and property. That's true, isn't it? The great and good, in inverted commas, of this world jealously guard their privacy. And you see every year or every couple of years they have a meeting of something called the G7, the seven richest countries in the world. You wouldn't get anywhere near it. They've got armed guards, they've got barbed wire and everything else. Davos, the meeting in Switzerland, takes place in January, where the movers and shakers of the world, the head of Amazon and Microsoft and government officials all turn up. I wasn't invited, were you? But I'm not. You couldn't get near that place. If we wanted to, after this service, we said, well, I'm Buckingham Palace is quite close, we'll just pop up and see the Queen. Do you think you'd get in? No, that's the mic might, but most of us won't. No, we wouldn't get in. <laughs> you wouldn't even get in to see David Beckham. You wouldn't get in. Because people keep other people away. And some people think, well, you know, I can just walk into God's presence any time I like. But you can't. Come into the presence of... When you just think that you and I can come into the presence of Almighty God, that is extraordinary, isn't it? It's extraordinary. And we need to think about it. In the Old Testament, a couple of people, sons of Aaron, made up an Abihu, they thought one time, well, we'll just go to God and we feel like going to God and we'll offer him this. God killed them. It's not a light thing to come into the presence of Almighty God. But the wonderful thing is that because God loves men and women who he created, he's actually always wanted a close relationship with them. I think that you can get that from Genesis, that it talks about God, the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You can get from that, I think, that he had a relationship with Adam and Eve, and he treasured it and enjoyed it. They broke it, of course. <coughs> The culmination of our salvation will be that God will dwell among us and we will see his face. That's a close relationship, isn't it? God has always wanted a close relationship with human beings whom he loves. But before Christ came, such a relationship was the preserve of very, very few. Enoch, who walked with God. Abraham, Moses, God says, I talk with him as I talk with a friend. The prophets, obviously. The high priest. But apart from those special people, the mass of the people, and even the mass of God's people, could not come into the presence of God. But since Christ came and died and rose again, everyone who believes in him is able to draw near to God. In fact, we're encouraged to do that. James 4, which I'll refer to again later. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. How amazing. What's necessary in order that ordinary people like you and I can draw near to God? Well, if the kingdom of God operated on the same principles as the kingdoms of this world, the people who could draw near to God would be rich people. They would be members of the aristocracy. They would be movers and shakers, the great and good, you know? People of great talent. Or gift. Those would be the kind of people, if the kingdom of God operated on worldly principles, they'd be the kind of people who could draw near to God. Or people who'd lived a really, really, really good life. Or people who'd done religious things. That's the way the kingdoms of the world operate. But that doesn't apply here. There is only one condition that you and I must satisfy in order to be able to draw near to God. And that is that our sin and guilt must have been dealt with. Our sin and guilt must have been dealt with. Now, you know, these days, sin and guilt, so, so old-fashioned, isn't it? Surely these words don't apply in the sophisticated 21st century. 
was reading a little comment uh, in the Times newspaper a couple of months ago. She, this lady, Kathleen Moran, her name is, actually brought up in Wolverhampton, the same place as I was. She's no way a Christian, no way a Christian. But she was commenting on a party. It was the 40th birthday party of Courtney Kardashian. I wasn't invited to that either. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, this party, as she described, it was thoroughly decadent. I mean, it was, and she actually said something. I wrote it down. It struck me. She said, it sounds borderline wrong, if that's a word we still use. You see what she's saying? In our modern 21st century, there's really no such thing as bad. There's no such thing as wrong. But there is such a thing as wrong, and there is such a thing as bad, and there's such a thing as sin. It's alive and well, and creating havoc like it always has. I think the problem sometimes is that we tend to think of sin in terms of murder or robbing banks or child abuse, and we kind of say to ourselves subconsciously, well, I've never done any of those things, so I'm not really a sinner. But sin's much more than that, isn't it? Sin is basically a failure to conform to God's moral law. And Jesus summed up God's moral law in Matthew chapter 22, when he said, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So any failure to live up to that standard, not just in action, but in thought or attitude or word, means you're not conforming to God's moral law, and that means you've committed sin. Therefore, logically, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yeah. God deals with people differently in this area, um, I think. Some people kind of get the fact that they are sinners quicker than others. I read about a lady called Frances Hunter with her husband Charles. She had a tremendous healing ministry. If you can buy her book, Healing the Sick, it's well worth reading. She died only about 10 years ago, well into her 90s, but she was... She didn't become a Christian, she, she was in her 40s. She was a businesswoman and doing pretty well. And then she had a car accident and she got injured a bit and it shook her up. And so she decided she'd go to church. And she said, I went to church three times a week for nine months before I got saved because I just could not accept that I was a sinner. God took time to get it through to her. In contrast to that, I read a couple of months ago about a lady called Jackie Hill Perry, American young lady. She was in a committed lesbian relationship. She had no contact with church or Christianity at all and didn't want it. And this is what she said in her testimony I read. She said, I woke up one morning, she said, my girlfriend and I had smoked all our cannabis the day before, so her mind was actually clear. I woke up one morning and she said, I felt God speak to my heart in such a way that I saw that all of my sin deserved death. Not just my lesbianism, it was understanding every single thing that I did and loved doing deserved God's judgment. For the first time, I saw my sin for the vomit it was and everything changed. She became a Christian. Now that's pretty spectacular, isn't it? Now, God doesn't deal with everybody in this area like that, but he did with her. In my own case, I didn't have much conviction of sin before I, before I became a Christian or even after I became a Christian, didn't have a great conviction of sin. But sometimes I think it through like this. My background many decades ago was in the legal field. And I sometimes think, well, everybody is entitled to a fair trial. That's a natural human right. So what if God gave you a fair trial at the end? And uh, he said, all right, Ian, we're going to look at your actions and but we're going to look at your motives as well and your words and your thoughts. And I don't have to think very much on that line before I say, God, I surrender. Be merciful to me, a sinner. If you give me a fair trial outside Jesus, I'm sunk. I don't want to hammer this aspect too much this morning, but it's got to be said because unless we understand how far off from God we were before we gave our hearts to Jesus, we'll never really appreciate our salvation or be thankful for it. 
And I'll tell you something else very practical in church life. Unless we understand how much God has forgiven us, the danger is we won't be very forgiving to other people. In fact, we'll be judgmental about other people. And that's deadly in church life. So it's very important, I think, we understand without hammering it too much, how far off we were from God before we gave our hearts to Jesus. There was no way you and I could approach Almighty God before we received Christ. You see, God is completely and utterly and totally holy. He is absolutely pure. A famous preacher called R.A. Torrey said, The holiness of God is the fundamental truth of the Bible, of the Old Testament, of the New Testament, of the Jewish religion, and of the Christian religion. God is absolutely holy. And you and I definitely are not. The Bible says there's not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and never sins. So our pride, or my pride, and my selfishness, my judgmentalism, my envying, my hard-heartedness, my mixed motives, they are offensive to a holy God. And they separate us from God. If you're not a believer in Jesus, then according to the Bible in Ephesians, you're far off from him. One Christian writer likened the gap between us and God to the width of the Grand Canyon in the United States, which is nine miles wide, which is 47,520 feet. And he said, well, some people think there's no gap between them and God at all, so they can just walk up to him any time they like. Well, hopefully we've dealt with that. Some people, though, quite a lot of people think there's a gap between them and God. There might be a gap, but it's not very big. It's maybe a yard or so. I can step over it any time I like, or I just live a decent life and uh, maybe do a few religious things and I can cross that gap. But the gap's much, much wider than people think until the Holy Spirit opens their eyes to it. It's like the width of the Grand Canyon, 47,520 feet. You can try all you like, you can't jump that. If you're the best long jumper in the world, you're not going to jump that. Uh, if you try and jump it, if you somebody can jump 10 feet, somebody else can jump 25 feet, somebody maybe can jump 30 feet, doesn't really matter, does it? They're nowhere near 47,520 feet. They'll all fall just as far and they'll all have the same end. You see, the reason we don't don't hammer this, but the reason we mustn't, mustn't lose it is that the Bible says that Jesus in his life on earth was an example to us, but Jesus didn't come to be an example to us primarily. Jesus was a teacher, a great teacher, but Jesus didn't come primarily to be a teacher. Jesus Christ was born to die. That was the supreme purpose of his life. And what a death it was. Some people have pointed out that if you read history, you'll find accounts of a number of people who have gone to their death with real serenity and courage. But Jesus didn't. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's lying prostrate on the ground. It says in Hebrews, he cried out to God loudly with tears, saying, oh God, if it's possible, let this pass from me. Was it that Jesus lacked courage? No, of course not. It was because of the awfulness of the death he was facing. Not just the physical pain, although that, that was immense, but the pain of being separated from his father with whom he'd had such a wonderful relationship during his earthly life. He who knew no sin, having the guilt of all the sin of the world placed upon him, bearing the anger of God against sin, which is what the word propitiation means, which is used a couple of times in the New Testament. That's why Jesus was in such anguish, because of the awfulness of the death he was facing. And yet, if you and I are not sinners, the death of Jesus was absolutely pointless and meaningless and unnecessary. We are sinners, the truth is, outside of Jesus, far off from God. 
But the Bible says, because of his great love wherewith he loved us, God did something about it to bridge that gap between us and him. He made a way by dealing with the sins that separate us from him, bridging the Grand Canyon, if you like. And his way deals with sin so completely and effectively, so wonderfully, that those who trust in him can come to him, can come to God with complete assurance and confidence and enjoy his presence. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, I'll put this on the sheet in more detail, but we can begin to understand how amazing it is that we should be able to draw near to God by considering the position of God's people under the Old Testament and comparing it with our position under the New Testament. Under the Old Testament, particularly this is set out in Leviticus 16, but you'll know this, many of you, under the Old Covenant, only one person, the High Priest, could come into the presence of God, he could only come once a year, and it had to be in the tabernacle or temple, one place, one person, once a year, in one place. The book of Hebrews specifically says that God was teaching us through that, that access to God was not open to all. The way to God was not open to all. And if you read the account in Leviticus 16, you'll find the high priest had to go through a very complicated procedure before he could get into the Holy of Holies. In fact, 15 different actions he had to perform before he could enter the Holy of Holies. It was time consuming, it was complicated, and it was messy because it involved the slaughtering and the sprinkling of blood of animals. What was God trying to communicate? through that in Leviticus 16. Well, as I've said, that he's holy and he hates sin. Secondly, that God's holiness and sin, holiness and his anger about sin has got to manifest itself. Got to. If God's anger at sin did not manifest itself, he would be denying his own nature and we could have no confidence that ultimately there will be justice in the universe. God's anger at sin has got to strike somewhere either on the sinner himself or on a substitute that God himself chooses. John Stott, great Bible teacher, the only way to be justified from sin is that the wages of sin be paid either by the sinner or the God-appointed substitute. In Leviticus 16, the substitute was a bull, a goat and two rams under the new covenant, the substitute is Jesus. Jesus. Now, although the Old Testament way with the high priest in Leviticus 16 was so complicated and everything else, the results actually were limited, the Bible tells us. Our position as Christians is infinitely better than the position of people under the Old Covenant. The Bible says, and Hebrews is the great book on this, of course, we have a greater high priest who's perfect, without sin, and immortal. He offers a better sacrifice, not the blood of animals, but his own blood. And he offers it in a better place, not in a tent or a building made with human hands, but in heaven itself. Those sacrifices that the high priest offered under the old covenant couldn't take away sins. They couldn't remove the consciousness of sins. The Bible says the fact that they were repeating every year, just reminding the people every year, you're sinners, you can't come near to God. But in contrast, the death of Jesus, represented by his blood, is wonderfully and completely effective. These are some of the phrases it uses in Hebrews about it. It says the sacrifice of Jesus for us cleanses the conscience. It puts away sin. It sanctifies us once and for all. Legally, if we've trusted in Christ, and permanently, we belong to God. Legally, we're perfect before God. Something we need to know. Just to kind of aside, but it's important, I'll be thinking about it a bit. It's very important we live our Christian lives from the basis of our position not our condition or our feelings. Do you know what I mean? 
our position in God's sight is that we are legally perfect because Christ's perfect righteousness has been given to us. So even if we're feeling failures and depressed and discouraged, we are still legally perfect before God. We need to know that. This is an old hymn by Isaac Watts. Not all the blood of beasts on Jewish altars slain could give the guilty conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ, the heavenly lamb, takes all our sins away, a sacrifice of nobler name and richer blood than they. Absolutely. It always excites me when I read things written by a Christian two or three hundred years ago and think, he knew Jesus. And I know Jesus in the same way. It links us up with them, doesn't it? Yeah. He got it. Absolutely he got it. The result of all this, Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. In other words, he's saying this is not just theory and theology. On the basis of this, God wants us to draw near to him in sincerity and full assurance of faith. Complete confidence. I was looking at this and God gives us not one reason why we can draw near to him in full confidence, but two. And that reminded me of this whole Testament scripture where it says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses that everything be established. God gives us two reasons why we can approach God with complete confidence. First of all, because of his death for us, obviously. But secondly, because he's our great high priest. And I, I've got to be honest, for years I never really understood the second one. I thought, well, if Christ's death is so effective, why do I need a great high priest? And then I read something by the Bible teacher Selwyn Hughes which says there is something to be forgiven in almost everything we do. There is something to be forgiven in almost everything we do. And I thought, that's true. I don't say it right. I don't do it right, 100%. My motives weren't perfect. There's something to be forgiven in almost everything we do. And we have... Satan, who the Bible calls the accuser of the brethren, who is busy accusing us before God all the time. All the time. All the time. And often what he says is going to be true. Oh, look what they did. Look what they said. Look at their heart. What we need is someone to represent us before God and to intercede for us, to pray for us. And who's that person? Jesus. Satan's accusing you, but Jesus is praying for you. That's why he's called in the New Testament our advocate. He's our defense attorney. So although Satan is accusing us, and rightly, because we have done wrong or thought wrong or whatever, Christ is praying for us. And his prayers guarantee our acquittal. In the presence of God, in defiance of Satan, Jesus Christ rises to your defence. So God gives us not one, but two reasons why if we've trusted in Jesus, we can come with complete confidence into the presence of God. He really wants us to get this. You see, in a multi-faith culture like we live in now, it's absolutely essential that as Christians we know what makes our faith unique. Why we're Christians instead of Muslim or whatever. Well, this is one of the things that makes Christianity unique. We can say to anybody else from another religion, listen, because I've trusted in Jesus, I can come into the presence of my God anytime, Amen. anywhere, Amen. with complete confidence. Amen. Anytime, anywhere, not just on Sundays. Some of you, there was a man called Nicholas Herman, and he was a... Uh, he was a cook in a monastery in France, I think. And uh, Nicholas Herman, although he was a cook, just a cook, he began to practice what he called a, a kind of habitual, silent 
conversation with God, no matter what he was doing, whether he was cooking or gardening or mending shoes, he, he, saw, he developed the practice of communing with God all the time, all the time, all the time. He, he said to himself, well, I can come into God's presence whatever I'm doing, wherever I am. Yeah. And it had such an impact on his life that the monks in the monastery took notice and they began writing down things he said. They wanted to know God like Nicholas Herman seemed to know God. And after his death, they collected these sayings together, plus letters he had written, and put them in a book, which some of you might have heard of. It's called Practicing the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. Brother Lawrence is Nicholas Herman. It's still in print 350 years after he lived. Now, when we meet as a church on a Sunday, God has said he's with us, hasn't he? And the presence of God has been here this morning. That's amazing. It should characterise the meetings of Christians, the presence of God, really. I've been challenged by that. But it's not just that we can come into God's presence on a Sunday. We can come into God's presence anytime, anywhere. Now, I'm very conscious that... London's a busy place, you're busy people, you've got jobs and family and all, you know, it's stressful, isn't it? You haven't got hours and hours and hours of time to spend in God's presence, but you've got some time. Maybe travelling to work or in your lunch break or something. What I'm encouraging myself to do and I want to encourage you to do is develop the practice of consciously coming into the presence of God whenever you have a moment. In fact, as you get better at it, you can probably do it while you're actually doing the job that you were employed to do. And of course, it's important as Christians we do the job we're employed to do. We need to practice this. Now, I've been trying to do this for a while, and I've got to tell you, I've found it extremely difficult. And sometimes preachers can make things sound a bit too easy, and I don't want to do that. This is not easy. I'll tell you why I, didn't. I, I think I didn't find, find it easy. First of all, we are absolutely hooked in Western culture on doing things. Sometimes even in church life, we're hooked on doing things. We're very good at that. We identify an issue that needs to be tackled, then we organize a way of tackling it, and then we implement that, and we are very good at that. And there's always things to do, and the, the problem is most of them, if not all of them, are, are, are good things. I'm not saying we shouldn't do things, I'm just saying it's very easy for us in Western culture to get the balance between being in God's presence and receiving from Him, the balance between that and doing things for God, it's very easy for us to get that wrong. People talk about the Protestant work ethic, and they, they use that phrase for a reason, that Protestantism is noted for this. So first of all, we're hooked on doing stuff. So that we even subconsciously think, if I'm not doing stuff, I'm just trying to sit in the presence of God, it's a bit of a waste of time. Secondly, life's incredibly busy, isn't it? So there's always stuff to do. And my experience when I began to try and do this was, I would sit down and try and come into the presence of God, and into my mind would come all the things I've got to do that day. And thirdly, we live in a culture where we've got distractions on every hand. The Apostle Paul, as far as I know, didn't have a mobile phone. But now, in our culture, you can literally occupy yourself 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, if you want. So because of that, I didn't find coming into God's presence and staying there at all easy. But I think it's absolutely essential. See, Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. Well, literally, that's not true, because we can actually do a lot of things without Jesus. What he's getting at is, we can't really do anything fruitful and effective without him. We've got to be linked up to the vine, right? Amen. So this isn't easy. But what I found, and I'm not pretending for a moment I'm there, I'm not nowhere near there, but I have noticed some improvement. What I've found is, as you persist, it becomes more natural to you to be in the presence of God. 
more natural. <coughs> Somebody, a book I read, this guy, there's two words in the New Testament to do with baptism, bapto and baptizo. Bapto means to dip. Baptizo, which is the word that is used for Christian baptism, is more than dip. Baptizo means you thoroughly immerse something in liquid. And one of the um, Greek writers in the centuries before Christ, he used that word to describe how you would put a vegetable in boiling water. What happens if you do that is the nature of the vegetable is changed, you know? And this guy used the example, if you put a cucumber in boiling water and leave it, it becomes a pickle. And so he said, I've developed in my life pickling. Where I come into the presence of God and I stay there, and I get pickled with the presence of God. It's our blood bought right to draw near to God in confidence. Now it struck me, surely coming into the presence of God has got to be a good thing, hasn't it? Surely coming into the presence of Almighty God has got to be beneficial. Well, it is. James 4 8 again, you will draw near to God and God will draw near to you. What about that? Isn't that amazing? If I will draw near to God, God was no reason he will draw near to me. In particular, just quickly, the Bible says we can draw near to God in full confidence to receive mercy and grace to help us in time of need. Hebrews chapter 4. We can draw near to God to receive mercy. Anybody doesn't need mercy? I need mercy every day of the week. Well, if I come to Jesus, I will get it. And grace to help. In this case, grace is salvation grace. Grace is the power to live the Christian life day by day. So when I need grace to live the Christian life, which I do every day and every minute of the day, Hebrews 4 says, I can come to Jesus in full confidence, knowing that I will receive what I need. Knowing that he's not only able to help me because he's all powerful, but he wants to help me because he's lived down here and he knows what it's like. So when I go to God and I say, Lord, I'm struggling. I'm messed up. I feel discouraged. I've got no energy or Jesus understands and he says, sure. I'm glad you can. I'll help you. When we draw near to God and enter his presence, we have changed. When Moses spent time in the presence of God, his face shone. Do you remember that? Yes. We are changed. And the Bible says in the New Testament, as we behold his glory, we are changed from glory to glory. So as you spend time in the presence of God, the Holy Spirit will work on you to change you in positive ways. I believe as we spend time in the presence of God, we are restored. He restoreth my soul. Who doesn't need that living in a place like London? It's a madhouse, isn't it? So much stress and rush and pressure, but he restores your soul. Amen. As you come into his presence, he restores your soul. I need my soul story very often. We experience refreshing as we come into the presence of God. When the prophet Elijah was at his lowest point, <clears throat> despondent, it says, the word of the Lord came to her and said, go and stand on the mountain in the presence of God. God's answer to his despondency was, come into my presence. I think it would be the answer for our despondency as well. I've said many times over the years, if God can only get your attention, he will always encourage you. His problem sometimes is getting our attention. Sometimes, being honest about it, when we come into the presence of God, God, because he loves us, will point out a few things in our lives he would like to change. He's got to be honest about that, but he doesn't do it as a harsh disciplinarian. He does it as a loving father. I need that, don't you? I need somebody who loves me to bits to say, Ian, you're going a bit offline here. There's a few things creeping into your life. Discipline. So, 
let us draw near. I believe there's tremendous potential in this for us as Christians. And it will make us absolutely distinctly different to the world. Wasn't it the Sanhedrin said to Peter and John, they looked at the ignorant people and they realised, they said, these men will be Jesus. You see what they're saying? They looked at them, they were nothing in the eyes of the Jewish religious rulers, but they, they said, no, there's something different about these people. Oh yeah, they, they've been with Jesus. I mean, wouldn't it be great if somebody said that about you? There's something different about you, you know, what is it? I think there's tremendous potential. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't limit God, you know, because there are times when people are drawn near to God and he's coming such amazing power it's been written about in books. The Hebrides revival was like that. God's presence was so manifested. Read about a coach of people, busload of people, and going somewhere in the Hebrides to one of the revival meetings. And as they drove along the road, he said, the presence of God came into the bus. And they all felt compelled to get out. And they were singing, they're just kneeling by the bus in the, in the road. Crying out to God. See, when the presence of God comes, something happens. Now I think we need that. So I'm going to invite you just for a few minutes. I'll hand back to Pastor Mike in a minute, but let's just stand, shall we? And thank you for listening. If you were listening. <laughs> so we just want to take a moment to. We sang about it earlier, it was great. Here I am, you know, Lord, I'm a very ordinary person, and that's the truth of it. The world doesn't know me. I don't get invited to Buckingham Palace or the Davos meeting or anything else. But here I am, and because I've trusted in you, I can come right into your holy presence. Now it says in Hebrews 10, we were drawn here with a sincere heart. In other words, we're not playing about. And it says, let us draw near. In other words, you've got to do something. I don't think God ever responds to passivity. So if we're going to come into the presence of God, if you're going to come into the presence of God, you have to consciously do it. It's not complicated. You just have to say, Lord, I'm trusting in Jesus. I'm coming into your presence right now, confident that you will receive me. So let's just do that for a moment. Lord, we do that. We recognise you're here because you've said so in your word. And so we just consciously again come into your presence right now. Now Lord, only you know the needs that are represented here. I don't. But I know enough about life to know there are going to be people here worried about their finances, worried about their job, worried about their family, worried about tomorrow. Worried about the world situation, only you know. Worried about their physical health, only you know. But Lord, you do know, and you're able and willing to do something about it. And as we come into your presence, Lord, we are changed and restored and refreshed. If we're discouraged, you will lift the discouragement as we see Jesus again. So I pray, Holy Spirit, you will do that just as we wait a few moments for you just as we wait a few moments for you. Now touch my brothers and sisters, Lord, in whatever area of life they need your touch. How wonderful. How wonderful to be able to come to you. Hallelujah. Lift that discouragement, Lord. Lift that worry and anxiety. Touch them, I pray. In whatever way you choose. Amen. Amen.